Story time here on the exam room podcast brought to you by the physicians committee. And when I say story time, I'm talking about perhaps one of the most remarkable stories you will ever hear in your entire life. My guest today is someone who has had a health transformation and then some. To this day, she is still defying the odds. She is an inspiration for so many. She has become a case study. And let me just rattle off what Kate McGoy Smith has done. She has reversed blindness. She has reversed type 2 diabetes. She is dealing with a very specialized pulmonary hypertension. It's a terminal disease, but as you are about to see, she is still very much alive and well. And there's a whole lot more to this story, but I just, I have to let her tell it because it is quite literally perhaps the most incredible thing I have ever heard in my entire life. And I mean that. Kate, thank you so very much for being here. I'm very delighted to be here, Chuck. Thank you. Thank you for being an inspiration. Now, let me ask, so let's check these boxes here so people get an accurate idea of everything that you've gone through and continue to go through. Uh, Reversed blindness, that is correct, correct? Yes, absolutely. Type 2 diabetes, we're able to reverse that as well. Yes, I was, especially with a 15.1 A1C. All right. I told you it's going to be a good story. Uh, Talk to me about this very specialized form of pulmonary hypertension. I understand it's it's a terminal disease. It is a terminal disease. Unfortunately, it's called idiopathic. So I say even the idiots don't know the cause or cure. Pulmonary arterial hypertension. So it's very rare. It only affects two to four in a million. And it's localized high uh, blood pressure in the pulmonary arteries of the lungs. So it's not like what people might think when they hear hypertension, because many people feel that's almost a rite of passage at about 40, where you um, have high blood pressure and you get cholesterol, and then you have to deal with it. Um, this um, This is symptomatic where you have... Uh, quite acute swelling in your abdomen, your upper legs, your ankles, you have shortness of breath, you're subject to fainting, uh, dizzy spells, and uh, your oxygen depletes very quickly. Uh, it, I came, it came for me with severe right-sided heart failure. And uh, as a result, I was, at, and at the time I was diagnosed, uh, because it's so rare, Uh, affecting only, as I mentioned, two to four in a million, I was told I only had two to five years to live. And most people, because it's so complicated, and I think if people are understanding the medical profession better, that they're more like medical detectives. They have to rule out a lot of stuff before they figure out what you actually have. And I understand that partly because I'm a former registered nurse who worked in the operating room bedside and community uh, before I entered um, uh, clinical social work as a, a, so, a therapist. And um, so it takes about two, sometimes up to two years just to diagnose. And at that point, most people are immediately sent to palliative care or they don't even survive the diagnostic process. And it's discovered on autopsy. And how long ago, again, was this diagnosis? I, I, uh, it took about nine months to diagnose. And then in December of 2007, I was given a right heart cath where they have to go through your artery here down into, they take a wire and put it down into the chambers of your heart, then into your lungs. And you're awake during it. You actually have to, they secure a bed in ICU because it can be, that can be dangerous to your health. You can, it can have adverse effects. And what they ironically want to do is part of the test when they first diagnose it, and they want to make sure it's a foolproof, it's a kind of the gold litmus test to do a right heart catheterization because the drugs that they have to give you are so severe uh, that they would cause a lot of damage to you if you didn't obviously need them. And so uh, what they do is they actually test to see if you'll respond to nitric oxide gas, which would be a vasodilator. And unfortunately, I failed that test. Um, And uh, no amount of studying would help me pass it. And I had to immediately go on medications. And they have different levels of medication. And the first, believe it or not, and I can really appreciate this, and the men might appreciate this in the crowd, is I had to go on Viagra because it was originally a heart drug. 
and uh, it's be a vasodilator. So it's trying to open up your your arteries uh, to get as much blood flow in because blood, of course, carries our nutrient and oxygen to all parts of our organs that we need vitally. And um, so I was put on that. And within a matter of a couple of months, I was left blind. Mm. So blind that when I looked in the vanity mirror to brush my teeth, all I'd see is black, black wow. face, black mouth. Yeah. Wow. So it was like I was drunk trying to brush my teeth because I could not figure out where the toothbrush went for a while there and had to adjust to a blind world. And I was also put on oxygen and you know, they usually give you these little carrying wheeling trolleys with the oxygen. And unfortunately, even a little pebble can twist it and turn it. So your wrist is really sore. It's not like these wonderful gizmos uh, for golf carts or anything. It's, it's very um, a low end. <laughs> so I ended up carrying my oxygen tank on my back. So I look like a scuba diver with a plastic mustache, dark glasses and a white cane. So I was like the modern walking elephant person, you know, the elephant man. Well, you know, because people just didn't even know what the heck was coming toward them. Yeah. But to um, look at you today, I mean, you would just, you would never, ever, ever know. You yeah. look so healthy today. That's, that's well, just amazing. Thank you. I, I feel pretty good. And, and yet I, I'm struggling with some of the side effects um, because again, modern medicine is, uh, tries its best. There's excellent at acute care, but you know, and the whole goal is I had five specialists in my life and the whole goal of my pulmonary specialist was to just keep me alive a little longer. The idea is to try to slow down the progress progression of the disease with very heavy duty. Some of them were, I was on experimental drugs because they're trying everything at it. But what they forget is, guess what? They're only thinking of my lungs. They're not thinking about my eyes, my liver, my heart, um, you know, anything else. So uh, unfortunately, are my kidneys, and unfortunately, my kidneys took a real beating. And so I'm at end-stage kidney failure right now, and have been since 2013, and yet I remain off dialysis. So I'm hoping that gives some hope to people who are challenged by kidney disease because there's many, many um, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people there. I know there are millions of people affected by kidney disease and the plant-based diet has continued to keep me alive. I absolutely love, love your optimism and your drive to inspire others and offer that hope. And I think hope in your case can come as simply as crunching some numbers. So you, you get yeah. your first diagnosis in December, I believe you said December of 2007, 2007. Yeah. right? So then you're looking at a uh, terminal within two to five years, but yes. you don't have I had to be three young children at the time. Right. As well. Right. So, and I was very involved. I was, uh, actually I was working in a job where I was, had started an initiative program of a free on-site counseling program for kids from pre-kindergarten to grade 12 and their families. I started it from blank paper and I was the sole practitioner. And as I continued to work in the program, I became, I was the clinical supervisor and manager of 12 counselors and 13 school sites. And that's what I had grown in six years. Yeah, it's never a great time to get a diagnosis no. like that. Uh, but uh, as what I was saying with, with the numbers here, I mean, clearly to put mm. it in sports terms, you've outkicked the coverage significantly here. Um, but my question is, with this condition being so rare, yes. I, I mean, is it just like kind of bad luck? Is it diet driven like we hear about with other forms of hypertension? They have, because it's idiopathic, they actually do not know what the cause or cure is. They still can't figure out it. They believe it is a, some kind of form of autoimmune disease. Uh, unfortunately, when something's so rare, guess what? There's no funding. There's no support. We actually, my husband and I had to start the support group with another patient uh, because the hospital, fortunately, I'm in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and uh, that hospital, uh, Peter Lougheed, where I received my treatment, it actually served not only uh, Southern Alberta, but even the province next door in BC for patients. So they had to travel 
to get treatment there because there's just not that many uh, pulmonary arterial specialists um, to be able to get treatment even. What was it like the day that you got that diagnosis? I would imagine Ooh. that I, I mean, saying that it was like getting hit with a ton of bricks wouldn't come it was. close to I that. I felt I've, I've referred to it actually, Chuck, as when I talk to people, because I do some whole plant based coaching and lifestyle, and I come from it with a psychological flexibility because I use my counseling skills as well. Is I will say it was like I got hit, I was, I was, um, a front on full head collision, where some people, let's say, have just diagnosed with diabetes, they say, you know what, that can be a fender bender. And you can kind of uh, punch that out and you can get going with your life. But I had a full on major car collision. And so my body was never going to be quite the same. I'm not going to be the typical success story um, that, you know, I don't have any, I walk away with zero health problems, as we often see in other success stories, which is really exciting. And I'm so happy for them. But that's just not the case for me. And when I was diagnosed, I actually they knew I had severe right sided heart, they first diagnosed that I had all the swelling and they diagnosed that I had type two diabetes, which I felt really bad as a nurse, I thought, I kept putting it off. And I think moms out there will understand, I really thought, oh, it's just I'm working too hard. I've got three kids, I'm their homework helper, plus I'm working full time, in a demanding, emotionally draining job of dealing with kids from suicide to conflicts to whatever, you know, abuse situations. And, um, and uh, so and my diagnosis with diabetes, I ended up having an A1C of 15.1. That's how much I had put myself on the back burner. Maybe I wasn't even on the stove at times. And uh, and so I, I, I was looking at dealing with that, but they discovered I had a heart problem. And it turned out I had severe right-sided heart failure. And um, a specialist uh, interviewed me at the heart clinic. And uh, he also referred me to the sleep clinic, where it turned out that I had um, uh, uh, sleep apnea, which is uh, a sleep obstruction. And uh, so my my sleep specialist said, oh, you know what? If you just go on CPAP, your heart will remodel, you'll be fine. But literally in about a month later, when she redid the tests, she came back to me, uh, reviewed at that time with another doctor. And I thought, this is kind of strange. Why is she doing this review? Um, and uh, I had a you know, I think God gives you those inklings. And that's when she told me, she said, I'm provisionally diagnosing you with idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension, which I'd never heard of. And, um, and she said, you only have two to five years to live. And then I was put immediately in the waiting room. And the funny story here is there is a funny part of it. Um, and maybe that's what's helped me along the way is, um, you know, my husband and I were then they gave us some papers because she said, I don't know how you've ever been able to work, like how you even stood up. And I can remember a few times almost fainting at the photocopier. And again, I just thought I was a little bit tired. Um, and uh, so we were out in the parking lot. And if anybody's been at a hospital parking lot, they're really expensive. And we were sitting there crying and crying our hearts out. And then I all of a sudden said to my husband, oh, my God, like, we got to get going. This is really expensive to cry here. Like we better get the heck out of here. And I said, can you drive? And so, you know, what he did, he said, yeah, I think I can. And he pulled himself together. We paid. And then we drove off somewhere where we could cry with for free. <laughs> <laughs> levity, levity yeah, in a situation it, like it that. It certainly has helped me many times. I will tell you, Chuck. Well, that's, that's what I was just thinking. I mean, yeah. you get a diagnosis like that and clearly you're still standing and there yeah. is that old adage that laughter is the best medicine. You yeah. who has worked in medicine your entire career, is yes. there something to it? I think it, I think, I that think you're so that there too. Is. I, I saw it many times, you know, when I was about 15, I began working as a nurse's aide and they often made me, um, take care of uh, patients like I dealt with a lot of dying patients. I dealt with patients recovering, like going through withdrawal from drugs, because of course, I was a lot cheaper body to have in the room than a nurse. 
And, uh, and I had to find some of the humor of it. Like I still remember a man wearing, it was a wonderful, wonderful man. And he was very thin and he was wearing a large Timex watch. And all I could think in my head was, and I was hoping no one heard it out loud. I thought, you know, they said the commercial Timex commercials, they go through skiing and everything and they go, and it keeps on ticking. And all I could think of is he's dying and it keeps on ticking that clock. And so I began to realize I needed that sort of black humor to help me through some really tragic things at a fairly young age at 15, you know, doing this kind of work. And I've continued to use that humor throughout. And it really helps give you the bounce that you need of that resiliency, I find. Well, let's talk about, let's try to put this in a little bit more of a chronological order here. Sure. So um, we, we've we got, uh, I, I mean, we've got the disease here. We, we've got mm. the, the blindness and the diabetes. Um, when when did the blindness and the and the diabetes first surface for you? Uh, well, the, diabe- the diabetes came be- just before the diagnosis in 2007, um, probably about a month before, uh, because, and that's, and that's when they realized I had type two diabetes. So they gave me a few weeks off. So I guess what the first book I got um, was Neil Bernard's book. Oh, reversing diabetes. Okay. It was the only one available. We have a large bookstore chain at the time called chapters, and it was the only one available. And I was like, what do you mean? Like food? How is that possible? So we tried it. it you know, I was, we were pretty clumsy at it. Um, but I was really excited. And what I did is I was able to get my A1C down to um, seven from 15.2 down to seven feeling following Neil Bernard's book. I was so grateful that I actually called PCRM.org, had to look them up and just said, I just want to thank you for, for this book and thank Dr. Bernard. It really means a lot to me. And that was my journey of being introduced to a lot of whole plant-based leaders. And, um, you know, uh, one of the things that also helped is we had a, a, a national uh, sort of speaker called George Stropanopoulos, and he had what we call red chair interviews. He had these big, bright red chairs. And he's kind of like who you, your Stephen Colbert or uh, another, you know, famous person in, in your, in the United States. And he came on one night, and I do believe this is when I was blind. Um, and I just happened to have the channel on there. And I do feel that was honestly a gift from God, because of course, I couldn't see anything on television. And um, he came on and he said, I saw a documentary called Forks Over Knives. It changed my life. It might change yours. And that's all I'm going to say. And I was totally intrigued. I had been a client of the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. I just applied for a scholarship so I could have voice activated computer because my whole goal was to write goodbye stories to my children. And um, uh, so I wrote to the producers of Forks Over Knives, asked them, is it ever going to come to Calgary, Alberta? And they thought maybe in a year's time. And lo and behold, in about a year's time, it came. And it was an alternative theater, which meant walking up two flights of stairs, which honestly was like climbing Mount Everest for me with the oxygen, the blindness, the tank on my back. And guess what? We did it three times. And I sat right in the front row so I could hear, see some shadows, but I could hear it all. And we, why we went three times is because we took um, our children to it. We took our oldest and then the other two. And we said, this is how we're going to try to eat. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. See, now when I said at the top of the show that this is going to be perhaps the most incredible story we've ever told on the exam yeah. room. Uh, yeah, this is why I, I said that. This is just yeah. absolutely remarkable the way that everything had played out for you. I do believe, uh, God, I mean, I know everybody has their own spiritual beliefs, but I do believe uh, God's been a great companion and just the odds, because do you know what? At the time, when I once turned the TV was on and the Stephen Colbert show, when he was that doing that political kind of spiel that he did, I actually thought that was best have been Fox news. I'd heard about Fox news. Of course, I would never been able to see it. And I thought he was saying such outrageous things. I thought, well, I think this is Fox news. So I turned it off immediately. I had no idea it was a comedy show. 
<laughs> no comment. Yeah, uh, okay. I was going to say, well, through, through the, you know, when you're blind, it's amazing what you don't also know, but you, you pick up other things. But like, I had no idea. I didn't know, for example, when I learned to start cutting up vegetables and stuff, I would cut my fingers on mushrooms. I found that really hard because mm. I could only stand at my island for maybe a minute because I would be too exhausted. So I had to sit at the dining room table. I had no idea there were sliced mushrooms available. What and was I was really excited when I found that out because oh, I was blind gosh. and of course could not see that in the store. Game changer. Yeah. yeah. So let, let's talk about some of those other simple tasks that yeah. the majority of us just kind of take for granted. I mean, you yeah. mentioned brushing your teeth a little bit yeah. earlier. Now you're talking about chopping vegetables and yes. how just climbing two flights of stairs for you was like climbing Mount Everest. What oh. are some of the other simple things that most of us don't even think twice about? Well, I was very lucky we had an electric stove because I, of course, I had an oxygen and I had a 50 foot oxygen cord attached to me because it's very expensive to carry around tanks in the house. So they have an oxygen oxygen generator. And so, um, you know, because I could have blown up when I was cooking even. So I had to be really careful. I had to learn how to use a stove, uh, which was pretty scary um, for me because of course I didn't want to get burned. And I also was had oxygen around in my nose and on a long cord, I didn't want anything to explode. Um, so there was just even, you know, daily things that I was a homework helper to my kids, but they would have to sort of read. I couldn't read even one full sentence. I could try to, with a magnifying glass, I could get one word at a time. I felt like a grade oneer because by the end of the sentence, I was like, what was this about? And so I ended up giving all my professional library to a domestic violence shelter uh, for their staff. And, um, you know, that felt a little heartbreaking because I thought that was the end of my my career life and my identity that way. And that was a really tough blow, but I also knew that it was a, for a good cause. But two of the things, Chuck, I will say were my North Stars when I got diagnosed. I didn't want my children to know the severity of my prognosis of uh, death um, because they were young. They were school age and one was just beginning high school kind of thing. And um, so I treated it like sex education. If they ask questions, I would be honest, but otherwise I asked them not to go on, uh, you know, on the internet because they would get maybe misinformation and that I would be honest with them. And so it just, when they were, they were ready, then I could share a little bit more information, but they also saw that I was deteriorating. So I said to them, there's two things I can do. One is I can try to take worry away from you. So I'm going to make a promise to you that I'm going to try as hard as possible to get as well as possible. And the second thing is, I don't have a corner on suffering. You suffer, I suffer, everybody suffers. So I've got to find a way to make a contribution to the, to the world, to the community. I don't know what i will be like. Maybe it'll be a smile. Maybe it'll be something bigger. I have no idea. But I have that obligation. That's why I'm here on earth is to make some kind of contribution. And those have continued to be my North Stars um, even today. Your outlook on all of this is just, it's so profound to me. And it's its definitely going to leave a lasting impression. Um, did you always kind of have this optimism? I mean, you talked about going to see Forks Over Knives three times and yes. being so gung-ho about it and saying, this is how we're going to treat this. Yeah. Were you absolutely convinced that you would have this remarkable turnaround or what were your expectations? I, I had absolutely no expectations. In fact, Chuck, all I knew is the only possibility of me living a little longer than the than if I got to live to five years was a lung transplant. And so what I did know about organ transplant is that you have to have the rest of your body as healthy as possible. Because obviously, they don't want to give such a precious gift to someone who has cancer part of their body, um, or something like that, you know, or has diabetes in their body. They want to make sure this transplant lives on for a long time, because there's been a great sacrificing gift given. And so all I thought of is, you know, when I found out that, you know, when Dr. Esselstyn talked about the fact that there's no morbidity to this and that you could only improve, I thought, okay, I'm not a gambling person, never bought a lottery ticket in my life. I'm going to go ahead and say, 
this makes sense. When I heard the science behind it, I'm very much believe in science and, um, and its value. Um, and uh, my husband and I both went like, this is what we got to try. This makes sense. And so all I cared about was, could I last long enough to have a lung transplant and try to get my body as healthy as possible? And that's what I went in with. In the meantime, I had the side effects or the side benefits of not being diabetic anymore, um, getting my eyesight back after 15 months of following a whole plant-based diet, um, being able to have more energy. I lost about over 100 pounds. I, you know, was took off all, almost all my medications except my pulmonary arterial hypertension meds. Uh, they came a couple, uh, about a year, half later. And, um, you know, I was really thrilled and I was able to exercise up to an hour a day. Yeah, Kate. So here's here's some kind of the way that I'm looking at this. You were diagnosed mm -hmm. with a terminal illness and then sprung back to life. Yeah. Uh, not a whole heck of a lot of people can say that. I want to ask you specifically, though, about getting your eyesight back. This is yes. something I've spoken with Eric Adams about. He was able to reverse his diabetes and regain his eyesight, but we didn't exactly walk through what that process was like. Was it a gradual regaining of your eyesight, or did you wake up one morning and just all of a sudden you could see again? Oh, wouldn't that be neat if you could just wake up and have that happen? <laughs> um, actually, I got inspired because at the time I was taking uh, the Starch Solution Graduate Certificate. Um, I've taken the Cornell one and I've taken this one and a few other things. But I was taking that and it was John McDougall that inspired me. I was listening to it by tape because I was blind. And... Um, and he said, you know, you can actually reverse your, your blindness. And what I knew about my blindness was when I went to my retinologist, who is a wonderful man, Dr. Williams, and he said, uh, I, he said, well, you know, I, I said, you know, what can I do about this? And he said, well, Kate, and he said it with my husband there, so it wasn't my imagination. I remember him saying it really clearly. He goes, well, Kate, it's honestly a choice of yours. You have to choose between your lungs or your eyes. What do you want to choose? Because my medication was contributing to the to my blindness because I was having a lack of oxygen to, to my eyes. And the diabetes, diabetes, I had diabetic retinopathy as well. So when he said, you have to choose between your eyes and your lungs, what are you going to do? It took a matter of like seconds. I said, I choose uh, my lungs. And because I said, you know, my lungs, um, with my lungs, I can hug my kids. So that's all they need from me. Mm. And yet here you are today. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm looking right at you, looking right back at me. And <laughs> yeah. I mean, just uh, how filled with gratitude must you be to be able wow. to see again and not have to worry about nicking your fingers when you're chopping vegetables in the yes. kitchen and more yeah. so being able to see your children in addition to hugging them? Well, I mean, I, I didn't get to see my son graduate from high school. Like, you know, I was still blind at that time. And then I got to see them graduate from university. And that was really breathtaking and uh, very grateful um, for all of it. You know, um, I never asked myself, why did I have to have this? Because it's such a horrendous, horrible, horrible disease. You wouldn't wish this on anybody else. And um, so it's kind of like I took one for the team um, in having this disease and uh, no one else in my family has it. There's no generations of having it. It's just, you know, and it's not likely my children will ever have it. Um, so, you know, I am, I live with gratitude. Uh, and that's how I found it, forksmart.org, because I wanted to create a summit so that I thought I was saving up for a lung transplant. And um, I said to my husband, you know, I want to have Dr. Esselstyn come and Ann Esselstyn come to Calgary, which is known as Cowtown. Alberta beef is considered the number one resource uh, that we have here. And so, of course, uh, plant-based diet's not that popular, to be honest. That's cow food. 
even as one of my doctors actually said, oh, so are you still on that cow diet? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, so, and so I gave him a card once that I said, I'm, you know, I, I'm moving on the right direction. <laughs> the big funny. cow on it. Yeah. That's so, you know, so I ended up, uh, what I did was uh, we formed the summit and uh, we had Dr. Esselstyn and Ann Esselstyn come and we were really excited. And I thought if one person comes, well, we had almost 400 people show up. Um, and uh, and he uh, did a wonderful job for us. It was a Friday evening and he and it was just superb. And I just thought, and then it started, we started doing summits after that. And our last summit was with T. Colin Campbell and Dr. Shane Williams, who's a cardiologist practicing in Bracebridge, Ontario, who also all subscribed to whole plant-based diet. But we had to do it because of COVID. Um, we had to do it online, which was a bit disappointing not to have them in person. Because when our, our speakers come, we make all the food from scratch, all oil-free, whole plant-based. They're in hampers. They have a menu for the whole weekend. And we were so looking forward to hosting um, uh, T. Colin Campbell and his wife, Karen. Uh, but that wasn't possible. And um, and now we've sort of switched over. Uh, Forksmart.org, uh, a family has who's really been inspired to eat whole plant-based and has done that for a number of years, has um, decided to um, take over Forksmart.org, and they're going to open up a food service. So we're excited. My husband and I will be consultants to it. Um, and we're very excited about that because if we can marry um, really uh, the powerhouse of plants with convenience and delicious, nutritious taste, like, you know, we're going to get more people eating this way. And speaking of eating here, a uh, little bit of housekeeping with the, about the five minutes or so that we have left. Um, sure. What was your diet like pre-diagnosis? Was it that standard Calgary was, beef was, heavy diet? It was a standard American diet, but actually we had been, when we moved to Calgary in 93, we were actually vegetarian. Wow. And even vegetarian is, as we know, you know, we ended up a lot of nuts, a lot of dairy, and that didn't help me keep off the weight. You know, if anything, it helped contribute even more to it. And um, so, you know, even when people think that's healthier, guess what? It's just not healthy enough. Um, especially for some of us who may have other challenges, health challenges. So, um, so really going whole plant based was a, a radical change for our whole family that, and we all adopted it. And uh, I have a producer in my ear who's asking, well, how long did it take you to regain your sight? Was it that full four but, years between the time that it, your child graduated it, high school? And, no, it was and about 15 months. Um, I was blind for over five years. And then it was when I started eating this way, it took like to really understand it. I went down to the John McDougall program. He had a five day program where um, my son, but unbeknownst to me, did a little bit of a fundraiser because it would have been very expensive. Can you can imagine me let, being left alone in an airport with being blind and on oxygen trying to find <laughs> my way to John McDougall? <laughs> you know? So my husband had to go, of course, and give up work for those days. And of course, I had to rest between. And so from about starting that in December of 2012, it took about 50, I taught, started beginning of December, which I thought was the perfect time because guess what? That's the free pass time for everybody, anything they want to eat usually, right? Or yeah. drink. So I thought if I can handle Christmas, I can get through anything. And so he suggested, John McDougall suggested, like, try to do this for not just a month, but like as long, like maybe 90 days or whatever. So I thought, okay, April 8th is my birthday. I'll try to get to April 8th and then I'll allow myself anything I wanted. And I got to April 8th. I felt so much better, even though I could not yet exercise. It took about a year before I could actually have the strength to really exercise. Because you got to remember, I was in that major car head on car collision. So it was my body really had to do a lot of work to repair. And I was at level three out of four in my pulmonary arterial hypertension. It's now at a level one. So it's amazing. They've never heard about reversal before. Um, and so, yeah, it was about 15 months later and it was very gradual that I got my sight back. I started to notice like, oh, you know, I had really thick Coke bottle type glasses so I could hopefully see 
something a little bit if I was really close up. Um, you know, talk about invading someone's personal space. You have to look really close <laughs> <laughs> up at someone. And I just started to notice like, oh, I can, oh, I saw that. Or I saw a little glimpse of something. And I was sort of shocked. And it just gradually came over because I couldn't see traffic lights. I couldn't see anything like that. I had no idea. And then all of a sudden, one day I started to notice there was something red. And I realized it must be like a traffic light. And so it just came over very slowly to the point where I was like shocked that I finally, you know, because I'm so used to being blind. Um, and uh, I knew how to really walk in the dark all the time, that it was almost strange uh, to all of a sudden get some sight back. It was quite a shock. What a wonderful one at all. Absolutely. What what a yeah. gift. What a gift. Yeah. Um, uh, switching gears here uh, really quickly, uh, mm. you and I, before we started rolling on the interview, we're talking about the astronomical cost that is associated with treating yes. all of your conditions. And this Absolutely. is something that you looked at really extensively, the cost of traditional treatment versus the path that you're on now. Yes. How do the two compare? Okay, so we wanted to do the health economics because so many people go like, this is an exclusive diet. It's, you know, it's only for the rich or whatever. You have to eat all organic. And we say, no way, you know. Um, so what we did is my, my costs sometimes were, depending on the drug, it was up to $100,000 a year. And then the usual drug I was on, because was, I was piggybacked on to a couple drugs, was 3000 a month. And so for now, $5 a day, uh, arugula is probably the number, is the number one on the nitric oxide um, index. And so I eat about $5 of arugula every day, um, you know, following Dr. Asselstyn's six greens a day. Um, I don't quite have six greens anymore, uh, but I, ha I have huge amounts of greens all throughout my meals and everything. Uh, but I don't have them in between meals. Um, I find that was just like overloading me with food too much. And so that's what I do, like $5 a day compared to 100000 or 3000 a month. That is, is, well, not as remarkable as your entire transformation, <laughs> but certainly jaw-dropping nonetheless. Yes. And I would think that, you know, that that's going to apply for so many conditions as oh, well. Yeah. I mean, this makes it affordable for anybody. It, you know, I've lived early Orange Crate and I'm not really well off now. Like the legacy I can give my kids is health because of course my career got interrupted for many, many years um, before I could go back to doing some work and stuff like that. And so yeah, and I did some plant whole plant based coaching in the meantime, but being able to go back to offering counseling services, because and that's the thing I like to bring into the whole plant based world is I really work from a psychologically flexible point of view, and helping people overcome those barriers that might get in their way all that yucky stuff, all those difficult thoughts, feelings, memories, even bodily sensations that kind of get in our way and, uh, you know, uh, don't have so that we can kind of move toward more satisfaction in our lives according to who and what's important to us. And that's what I help people do. And I think there needs to be more work in this area because often people start a whole plant based diet, they kind of go on a honeymoon, and then they sort of wane off. And what we really want them to do is sustain it and see the long time value of living leaner, stronger, and longer. You know, I believe that uh, in, in your background here, I'm going to take myself out of the shot. Uh, I see a movie sure. poster over your shoulder. I believe it's it's a wonderful life. It's my favorite and movie. I'm telling you what, I mean, just the name of that movie sums up uh, your life to me. I mean, yeah. it's just absolutely incredible. And I will also say that the fact that you are working with people as a counselor, Kate, mm -hmm. I can think of no better person to work with someone than you because oh. of everything that you've been through, your experience, your life experience, and then your optimism on top of that. I mean, my yes. goodness gracious, what a privilege it must be. And I think that uh, if people head over to towardmoves.com,
that's where they can learn more about your yes, counseling services. Absolutely. Yes. And I'd be happy to work with anyone, especially if it's whole plant-based coaching, I can work with them internationally because uh, I'm a certified food for life instructor. I have my eCornell course. I have my starch solution certificate. I've taken through courses through, um, uh, uh, the Cleveland Clinic. So, you know, I have a real appreciation. I've taken even the Ruby cooking course. So uh, I've tried to really well arm myself with things to help people. And I'm only providing information um, and being able to help people find that psychologically flex, flex, find that psychological flexibility to really sustain what's really important to them and what matters to them. As I said, I mean, I just can't think of anybody better to to work with anybody on Thank the things you. that are dragging them down. So uh, yes. you you are the buoy to life, <laughs> and so you just kind of pull people right up out of the doldrums. and uh, And I'm so happy that you're here. Towardmoves.com you, is the website. You see the web address right there on your screen. Oh, uh, final question. Uh, so what are, what do the doctors say about your transformation? I mean, really quickly, we have about thirty seconds left. I well, wish that we had more time but they got to be just blown you know, away. Well, you know what? I wish they were, Chuck. I really wish they're... My kidney specialist is totally supportive of it. He's not giving me any hassles or anything like that. Um, and he's really supportive. But my pulmonologist, I came in with a poster at the time for ForkSmart.org for a summit. And he goes, why plant-based? And I've only been with him since 2007. So I was like, oh... You know, and that's the unfortunate thing. I've heard this over and over and over again, Chuck, from other people who come back to their physicians and told them or their specialists and said, look, this has changed me. And unfortunately, they're not curious. And so we understand why medicine moves sometimes so slowly, unfortunately. Well, the good news is we have quite a few doctors, dietitians, other healthcare you workers do. who listen to this show. And so yes. hopefully uh, they will pass this on to their colleagues I and, hope so. uh, and get some other people to uh, stand yes. up, pay attention. Because Well, uh, yeah. one of the things I have to say, the gift is it really made me a real partner in my healthcare because I realized that my fork was a very powerful tool. And so that really helped me really have more autonomy and feel really good, put me more in the driver's seat than in the back seat, uh, which often is what people feel when they all of a sudden get into the medical system. Well, Kate, you know, when I was a little kid, when I grew up, I wanted to be a baseball player. But now I think my goal is to grow up and to be just like you. Oh, boy, Chuck, I, I don't know what to say about that. Uh, I don't think I have the corner on, on bravery or courage or anything, or even optimism. I just know that, it, guess what? It can be contagious, and it's a wonderful contagion to have. You are the best. Kate McGoy-Smith, thank you so very much for being thank here, you. and congratulations for everything that you've been experiencing, and I wish you nothing but the best and continued health. Thank you so much. If your health IQ was a couple of points higher than it was a few minutes ago, go ahead and like this video or subscribe to the YouTube channel. And to take it even higher, head over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your favorite shows. Look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Hit the subscribe button there as well and help to make your world a healthier place.